Hello, everyone, and welcome to our session. Uh, today, we're talking about models of integrating communities and health. And um, we've got some good topics here today for you. And I'm kind of introducing it. These are all folks that are either within my office or funded by my office or are partners with our office. And so I'm going to tell you a little bit about who we are here in South Carolina. We are the South Carolina Center for Rural and Primary Health Care. And we were established in 2017 at the University of South Carolina School of Medicine through a legislative proviso through the State House. And basically, we're here to help support and develop primary care education, delivery, sustainability through practice, training, and research. Um, generally speaking, we're here to help support rural primary health care in just about every way possible that we can think of through a wide variety of partners. Um, such as the South Carolina Office of Rural Health, AHEC, Hospital Association, Primary Care Association, and universities and educational institutions across the state. Uh, we do have uh, several core objectives you can see here um, as far as improving workforce, uh, expanding specialized services and primary care services, um, trying to uh, address uh, these unique rural health challenges even here in South Carolina, uh, education and really trying to facilitate collaborations across the state, which is a large focus of what we're talking about today. Um, and here's kind of a wheel that kind of talks about these kinds of things where a lot of these areas like clinical outreach and innovation and educational partnerships, they flow in and out and interact with each other in, in many ways. You know, we have eye care, which is really pure delivery subsidies. Uh, we do innovative programs where we take uh, rural innovations uh, design ideas on an annual grant call. We have our libraries and health initiative that you're gonna hear more about here in a minute. A lot of our community partnerships are here under innovation as well. Uh, we do some educational and training as far as developing rurally focused training tracks and working with other educational partners. We do have a loan forgiveness program and other workforce development. For example, we help with our preventive medicine residency is a good example. Um, we are supporting residency slots in rural areas of our state. And we do a lot of rural health policy, research and evaluation and other research partnerships. Um, but what we're gonna kind of focus on today are three community partnerships that are developing unique uh, community focused type initiatives. Um, these are either uh, community led or have that strong partnership within the community. Uh, that's kind of a mantra of ours. When we work with a program, we want it to be community led or have that strong partnership. Um, a lot of these have local leaders as well. Um, we do fund a lot of existing programs and initiatives. Um, you know, for example, food share is a good example of that where we came in and helped them take that next step in some ways, especially with rural outreach. Um, some things like the libraries and health initiative, we, you know, helped a pilot project take those next steps and expand. So that, and that's kind of a big picture thing for our center is helping existing programs expand either services or locations. Um, adding to their scope, we have some programs like our infectious disease partnership where they're now working to eliminate hepatitis C, not just treat it or, or diagnose it. Um, and then we're really trying to bring in more of a community support, especially around social determinants as much as we can, and especially trying to make that strong connection to health delivery, health care, and access to care. And I think the programs that we're talking about today, libraries and health, food share, and the Arts Commission do a lot of this work and bring a lot of value to our rural communities and improve their health in many, many ways. So what we're going to do is, oh, and I forgot, uh, we do have a podcast that our center puts on around the state. And we've actually focused on these three programs on our podcast in the past. There's a rural libraries and health podcast um, episode, uh, the art of community and storytelling with Susan that you're gonna hear from in a minute and food access around rural South Carolina with Beverly that you're gonna hear from in a minute as well. And then there's a link here to some one pagers that go into a lot more detail about these projects um, as they are right now. So if you wanted to learn more, you should be able to click those links. Um, and if not, you can reach out to us and find these from us that way. Um, so 
with that all being said, I'm going to hand off to Dr. Megan Weiss, who is our Director of Community Engagement here at the Center, and she's going to tell you all about the Libraries and Health Innovations Program. Thank you, Kevin. Um, as he said, I am Dr. Megan Weiss, and I'm the Director of Community Engagement here at the South Carolina Center for Rural and Primary Health Care. And I've had the uh, immense joy and fun of helping to work on and develop and expand a pilot program um, that occurred in Union County, South Carolina, um, and also some work in Richland County, South Carolina, where social workers were based in libraries. So we were able to put together a program to help support libraries and support programs to build up the role of libraries as community hubs to connect people to healthcare and other supportive social services. And we refer to it as our Rural Libraries and Health Innovations Program. So I'd like to address perhaps the first question you're asking, uh, why libraries? What do libraries have to do with health and healthcare or public health? Well, they really do have the potential to be really uh, integral community resources, and they have been identified through the literature to be able to help improve population health um, through social policy. They have documented relationships to health. There are over 17,000 public libraries nationwide um, that receive an estimated 4 million visits every day. People are always going to the library, and over 95% of Americans do live in a public library service area. So when we're thinking about hospitals and hospital closures, pharmacies, pharmacy closures, um, and everything going on, almost everywhere there is a library or somehow access to a library. Also, in thinking about disparities, I know most of us here know that the United States does have one of the largest health disparities in the world. Uh, life expectancy variations can reach up to 20 years between counties in the same state. And also people who are experiencing homelessness or other life crises often tend to seek respite information and assistance in libraries. People go to the libraries for information and when they have questions or need help. Also in thinking about access, libraries and their staff are free to the public. Uh, they're located in local neighborhoods and they are truly deeply trusted institutions within their communities. Everyone is welcome. That is the truth. That is the reputation. Um, it is a place for gathering um, where everyone can go. And also 37% of library users uh, have reported using uh, the internet um, at libraries, utilizing that for internet access and to look up health information, treatment options, caregivers, and other ways to improve their health. So people are already naturally going to the library to find out information about health and how to be healthy and to get um, access to resources and information. So for the li Rural Libraries and Health uh, program, we do have uh, several goals to expand access to health and supportive social services increased health education and encouraging better health outcomes. And we have five funded programs here in South Carolina. We uh, put out an open call this past summer and we awarded five systems and I'll talk a little bit about each system in a little bit more depth, but they are in Union County, Lee County, Kershaw County, Orangeburg County, and in the rural areas of Charleston County. Uh, the funding is for one year initially one year at $100,000 uh, for up to three years renewable funding because we knew we wanted to do work in this area, but from the pre-work and the formative work and interviews and research that we did, we knew that you really need to have someone dedicated, you need dedicated staff to be able to uh, really truly make the type of difference and um, interest that we want to do with this. So we have systems all across the state. Uh, I'd like to share the map uh, showing that in our upstate, the Midlands, the PD, and in the low country to really explore different models, different areas, different ways of working. And uh, one of the specific things about this program is that we did not dictate exactly how this needed to be done. We did take a look at some previous programs that were in existence where our library housed a social worker or housed a community health worker or was a hub for telehealth, but we opened it up for communities and applying for the funding to be able to say, this is what we know we can do and what our community needs. And we feel like this is the model that will work for us. So in Union County, which is in uh, the upstate of South Carolina, they are focused on expanding broadband access. And they are specifically implementing a social worker position, the funding funds uh, the social worker position to focus on building those relationships, both with the school district uh, to work with families with children with special needs, along with, of course, everyone else who comes into the library. 
Something unique that they are doing is working on setting up micro branches at their local detention center and a local fire station. And they're actually utilizing the E-rate program from the federal government to be able to then take broadband and set up internet access at the, fire, the local fire station because they do not have internet there. And so the social worker not only will be in their main building, but also going to these micro branches as they call them throughout the county. Also, and I'm sure Bev will talk a little bit more about this recently, um, as in the course of this program, they've entered into an agreement with Food Share South Carolina. So we love it. Um, in South Carolina, we all try to work together as much as possible uh, to really get to all our goals. And also, this is the system that was featured on the Growing Rural podcast, and there's another link to that as well. And Taylor Atkinson, the director of the Union County Library System, shared this wonderful quote with us that the cooperative agreement allows her to, um, and the library system, to build on their previous experience and increase their services to the community and meet the needs that they see daily among their patrons. They were one of the original programs in, the, in South Carolina, originally funded through the Blue Cross Blue Shield Foundation of South Carolina, and they had a social work intern working with them. And um, they'd actually applied to the center, and it was just such an amazing program and we really saw the need um, that was there in Union but also the immense potential overall across the state through libraries and so really in many ways they uh, helped inspire the the broader program versus you know just uh, funding one program but building a cohort of libraries across the state to build a learning collaborative that we are forming with everyone involved. One of our other funded systems is the Lee County Public Library System uh, in Lee County, South Carolina, and they refer to their program as the Public Library Hub. And they really are focusing on increasing those clinical community linkages between the high-risk underserved rural residents and also connecting folks to social service and health providers. They utilize a community health worker model. They partner with Care South. And that is a, the local FQHC where they are. So in their case, the community health worker is employed by Care South, but comes to the library on very specific days, um, always the same days, is very much a publicized uh, time period. And so the county library has provided dedicated space, uh, room for health screenings. They're doing a farmer's market. And something that's really exciting uh, with them is they've been able to connect with the Lee County Transit System, and the health hub is now a stop on all outbound bus routes. Uh, they had originally planned to go out to some different areas, but uh, with COVID and some of the COVID limitations and, and safety precautions, they weren't able to. So they pivoted, and the library system now uh, uses partners with the transit system, sorry, to, to uh, have the bus stop along the way, which really addresses one of the other barriers, uh, transportation for folks. And also they have a very active uh, social media presence. So I just wanted to share some of these pictures with you that they post. There's a picture of the transit system where they're advertising on social media. And of course, through flyers and word of mouth and the community health worker and folks in the community, but also utilizing, utilizing social media. And also a photo of how they're actively involving uh, screenings and also vaccination appointments in the area. And their health, their health hub is every Wednesday from 10 to 1 p.m. Also Kershaw County Library, they are utilizing a social worker model. And so they have a social worker who works at their main office and also goes out with a bookmobile into some of their other branch locations. And they are also including telehealth services that are being coordinated through the library branches. They do have the dedicated room created to be able to do that. She, the social worker will be providing referrals to medical providers, health agencies, and behavioral health services. And they are really focusing with working with a local uh, access health network, which connects folks who are uninsured to healthcare and being able to make those long term connections for a, a healthcare home. And just wanted to show this picture, the local media that they had, uh, they were able to get a good amount of attention for this with hiring the new social worker who this was, she started just a few weeks ago um, and had recently relocated to the area. And so she is bilingual and she's working really hard and connecting with so many people in the community. And the word is just getting out there and it's really exciting in the area. They're also exploring the local free medical clinic is exploring getting some Medicaid reimbursement um, and also some Medicaid applications and looking towards sustainability. So that's something for us to learn more about as well as this program progresses. As I said, all these programs started in October of last year. 
In Orangeburg County, they are utilizing a social worker model. They're uh, not referring to their, their staffer as a social worker, but known as a library resource associate to also address the social determinants of health and social needs and provide those links of coordinating care with the library patrons to comprehensive health services. And they are very much focused on direct referrals to their local free healthcare clinic and also the follow-up of, of referrals. And they are intending to grow to include direct healthcare and telehealth opportunities as well. And they are in the process of hiring their social worker. Um, and the uh, in the lessons learned, I share a little bit about a lot of the lessons we have learned in just uh, the first several months of this program. And we also have the Women in the Southeast Telehealth Network or the WISE Telehealth Network in Charleston uh, with the Charleston County Library System. And they are specifically focused on disparities in women's health. This is one program that um, though, of course, the community health worker will help anyone who needs help and be able to connect them to resources. There is a specific push to connect with women to provide access to women's health uh, with health promotion and the disease pr prevention. They're also connecting women with SNAP benefits and Medicaid. They're utilizing their some text-based surveys in their evaluation. So that's something really interesting that we're excited to learn more about um, how that works and the effectiveness and what they learn. And the telehealth network, which is being conducted in partnership with the Medical University of South Carolina, MUSC officially launched on February 22nd of this year. And they really got a lot of attention uh, in the media. Uh, we'll share some of the links in the chat, uh, but some of the local blogs, the Holy City, Holy City Center, um, talking about uh, how they received funding to improve women's health, the Post and Courier, which is one of the major newspapers in the state, let alone uh, the area, has really been covering the Charleston County Library and their role in the COVID response. Uh, you can see local news channels are really talked about the telehealth launch and also some interviews that are available on YouTube and I will share that link in the chat. So as I've talked about just like the overview of everything they're doing, um, I'll, share, I'll share the link to, in the chat again to all the one pagers because there is a wealth of information of the specific goals and the successes so far and the future directions that each of these programs are taking as we're coming into really the second half of, second half of, of the year, the first year of funding. But we are uh, looking at a range of models and different partners who are working together in each community. And that's one of the things that as a center, we're really excited about to see what really works in a community. One, um, that communities tell us what they need and, and how it's going to, to work, but also so we can learn from you know, what works and what doesn't work. Because you know we, we all know that sometimes what doesn't work tells us as much as what is working. But for the delivery and also focal areas, we have social worker models, community health workers, uh, programs that are incorporating telehealth more, uh, and programs who want to and are looking for new ways to do that, focusing on women's health. The staffing models have been different too. In some cases, the social worker or community health worker is employed by the library. In other cases, it's a strong partnership with that healthcare partner and the social worker or the community health worker is employed by the, the healthcare provider. And also throughout the state, there are different partners involved. No one library system is doing this on their own. And as part of the application for the funding to be part of the cooperative agreement, we did need, they did need a demonstrated partnership with local a local healthcare partner, the type of healthcare partner was not specified, but we have free clinics, FQHCs, access health networks, transit authorities, and also academic medical centers. And that's just a small list of the partners who, who are part of all of this. Food share, as we saw in, in some of the counties, is, is a partner um, and other providers. So as I said, we're in the midst of the first year, but we're very excited about this. Uh, but so far we've been learning. Uh, one, you know, we saw this from the previous research and from the conversations we had prior, but libraries truly are natural partners and community leaders and hubs for this type of work. Um, of course, staffing and turnover can be challenging um, and the bureaucracies of hiring. Some, some of our groups have been able to do some of their hiring faster than others. It's just natural. It's, the, it's, the, uh, it's how things work, but you, know, you have staffing turnover and people who have to authorize things or supervisors. It can be a challenge in standing up the program and getting it started. Integrating the health staff, whether it's a community health worker, whether it's a social worker, whether it's someone else, really integrating with the library and not just being a visitor to the library is critical. Um, they really need to be part of the team, whether it's because of the close, close, close working relationship 
or because they are a staff of the library, it really needs to be a team. This isn't just, okay, a health system has decided they wanna do outreach. And so the library is letting them use the room. In Lee County, there is that dedicated space for the health hub, which was collaboratively brought together with all the planning around it. It's not just us saying, okay, we'll use the room in the library. The library is a full partner and it is critical. Also, we've continued to see a strong interest for telehealth in the applications. Uh, we saw some specific programs focusing on telehealth, for example, the Charleston example, but almost every program that is working in this past year has uh, expressed interest in telehealth or is able to pursue it in other ways. So I wanna say thank you before I pass it on to some of our other speakers. We have a link to uh, the center's website um, and you can also reach us at SC Rural Healthcare at uscmed.sc.edu. Follow us along at the Growing Rural Podcast. We're also on Twitter and Facebook. And then I'd also like to share the references with you as, as well and feel free to reach out to us as well. I'll be happy to send you these links directly uh, for the references that were used. And now I'd like to pass it along to Susan DePlessy to talk about the Arts Commission. Hello, and thank you, Meg, Kevin, and Bev for inviting me to join you in this conversation today. My name is Susan DuPlessy, and I'm with the South Carolina Arts Commission here in Columbia, South Carolina. I'm here to talk to you today about a new initiative. Actually, it's five years old now, called the Art of Community Rural SC. And we began this initiative to engage in deeper ways from the State Arts Commission with folks who live in our rural communities and small communities throughout South Carolina. I'd like to begin with a clip from a show that we made called Meet the Mavens. And it's gonna give you a little bit more detail about what this initiative is. And then we'll talk more and you will meet um, six of our mavens in South Carolina. Susan Duplessy. I'm program director for the Art of Community Rural SC initiative. We've just ended a two-day retreat for our mavens who are part of the Art of Community Rural SC and leading change in their communities across South Carolina. So this occasion was the expansion, marking the expansion from six original mavens to 15 total mavens representing 15 counties and cultures across South Carolina in rural communities. We came together here to get to know one another better, to bond, to learn more about each other's communities, to hear about our assets, and to discuss our challenges. But most of all, to consider how we can use arts and culture as key ingredients to combat some of the issues that we face in our communities across South Carolina. That friendship and that bond is really why I'm here today, because I want to come back and see my people. <laughs> This is exactly what I've been about for 40 years, really, that this has just been such a vehicle for us. The Arts Commission, I mean, we would not have made it with the yams and the everything else I'm involved in without y'all. My name is Laura Marcus Green. I'm Program Specialist for Community Arts and Folk Life. So we're talking about the idea that these art forms are community-based. They're a living part of the community. The aesthetics and the meaning of these art forms are defined by the community. The mavens are the main and key ingredient in what makes this program successful. They are the connectors, they are the bridges between the Arts Commission and the local communities. They are the bridges then within their local communities, building teams, connecting to the ideas and the issues and the assets and pulling it all together. I am Marguerite Palmer and I work and live in Newberry County. My first thought was, what the heck's a maven? And so <laughs> I looked up maven to see what the word meant. And so when I looked at it, it said a person who is an expert in their field, which I don't like that being, but then it said, due to experience, our time exposed to something because I am Marguerite, the person that's here at the Arts Center, 
is not through an education in schools. It was through a whole lot of trial and error and working with communities and being an artist and getting out there and talking to people. I'm just excited to find out and see some of the things that other communities have done that we can use here that's going to really benefit the community. Because again, it's not about the making of art and it's not about the displaying those things are great. It's about people's lives. So today I'd like to talk about why grassroots leadership and local voice matters and like to take a closer look at the context for the work that we're doing to talk more about this new initiative for change that's called the Art of Community Rural SC. You've just seen a film that talks about the Mavens. They are our key connectors, our grassroots leaders in 14 counties and one tribal nation here in South Carolina. Each of them has been challenged to do a community-based project that looks at health, education, or economic development and uses arts and culture in a strategic way to meet that challenge. So it's been a learning adventure. We've documented it and we're part of a growing field called creative placemaking. But first, I'd like us to take a closer look. What do we know about South Carolina? What do others say about South Carolina? How do we measure up? So in a, a tool kit called Prosperity Now, um, we see that South Carolina actually got an overall ranking of 50. Um, and that's 50 out of 50 states in the District of Columbia. We have a population of just over 5 million people. And this ranking was a comparison of the outcomes based on those five um, sectors below, financial assets and income, businesses and jobs, home ownership and housing, healthcare and education. And so the ranking also takes the, uh, into consideration the disparity between, um, between racial groups. And so this is one of the challenges that we have in South Carolina. And one of the ways that we are working differently through the South Carolina Arts Commission to engage with uh, grassroots leaders in rural South Carolina to, to meet these challenges. One of the other things that we know, and I imagine uh, most, um, if not many of you are from rural communities who are part of the conference today, and so one of the things that we, um, we know is how others perceive us. And so I like to point to this um, story that was in the Smithsonian Magazine um, back in 2014 and includes one of, as, as the travel writer came down through the South and documented and wrote about his experience, he wrote about one of the communities that is actually part of our initiative, Allendale, South Carolina. And his words were, um, um, he, he talked about decay and utter emptiness. Um, and so, and then he says he had an impression that was of astonishing decrepitude, as though a war had ravaged the place and killed all the people. Obviously, this fell hard on the, the hearts and minds of people working so hard in this community and other rural communities in South Carolina. And then later the book, The Deep South came out and, um, and it also includes some of this about, um, about the writer's experience in the Deep South. So the stories that are told about our places, sometimes we start to believe them. And this initiative, The Art of Community Rural SC was built to really um, work with local people to understand what they have and how they can tell their own story. We ask the question, if you're not telling your own story, then somebody else will be telling it for you. Also at the same time, in about 2016, this article came out in Stateline, which is a part of the Pew Charitable Trust, Can the Arts Help Save Rural America? And one of our advisors, uh, Chuck Fluharty, who was then the uh, CEO of Rupri, talked about the fact that if you don't build vibrant, inclusive, diverse places for young people, they're not going to raise their families there. They're simply not. And those communities will wither away. So this is one of the realities of our rural communities that we hear all the time. And we're working to engage young people as well 
in our process. So they have ownership and agency where they live. Um, our co-chair of the initiative, Bob Reeder, also was quoted in this article asking, can the arts save rural America? And he says, I would never call it a panacea, but it's another strategy we have in our toolkit. And so we like to think of what we've built here through the Art of Community Rural SC as a new framework for engagement in local communities. So what we did with this, uh, in, within this context was to create this new framework that would support new leadership, cross sectors, generate new energy, um, help local people tell new stories about their places and motivate action, especially in rural areas. So today I'd like to um, give you a chance to hear from some of our local voices, six of our mavens who are involved in this initiative. You see the map of South Carolina there. We started with the six county cluster down in the south, southern part of our state. And in um, the last year and a half, we've added additional counties where we're working. And so we like to talk about this initiative as spanning cultural landscapes and creative and traditional practices of, of local people. And that is our emphasis. So this is Lottie Lewis. Uh, again, we're gonna be hearing um, little clips from the Meet the Mavens uh, film that was, um, that captured the experience when we came together in September, 2019 to talk about our communities, to talk about this initiative and um, to be part of a network that cares about our state and our local communities. You know, sometimes when bad things happen, it causes good things to happen because it stirs a fire up in us and that's what we're doing in Allendale. And that's why we, the word that I used today was forward because we're moving forward. And there is beautiful changes happening in Allendale right now. So you've just heard the voice of Lottie Lewis, who is the maven for Allendale. And um, she has coined her own word, forward, I would say forward with persistence. Um, she leads a team that's doing remarkable things in this community. And um, you see here a little snapshot of um, some of the things that they've done in the, last, in the last year, including recognition of hometown heroes and a giant thank you mural that was um, that was constructed to thank those hometown heroes. And uh, this work has been recognized nationally. Um, and a sample of what's happening in Allendale uh, through our initiative, through the um, bolstering of local leadership and emphasizing connectivity between arts, culture, and the many sectors that make our community you see that um, Lottie and her team have been really, really active and um, integrated into a number of different arenas that affect health. So um, we're especially proud of, of the work that they've done there in Allendale, which of course is, is the community that was referenced in the earlier um, book that I mentioned. So now we're gonna hear from um, Audrey in Hampton County. My name is Audrey, and I'm a maven in Hampton County, South Carolina. Being part of our community, it helps us bond together, and then it helps us share our dreams toward other cities and other counties. If I had to come up with one word for Audrey, it would be resourceful or resourcefulness. Um, in the middle of the pandemic, uh, their community was hit with a tornado, and uh, multiple lives were lost. Um, the community was was uh, and homes were destroyed. And so uh, through that, Audrey has, um, with her team, come together to really meet those challenges and to step up to the plate in new ways that people never expected. She also has worked with her local uh, town of Estel to amplify the asset that they have in the um, walking trail there in Estel, uh, South Carolina. And, um, and so it's been exciting to see the work that they've done together to, um, to sort of change the narrative and also own their own story there in Hampton County. Um, you see here a number of the things that uh, she pulls out and talks about 
um, that has been so important in the last year. And um, she's been recognized for her leadership and part of the work that she's done has helped spur the development of a new leg of a, a coastal community foundation um, that, that earlier did not serve Hampton County, but now does. So um, she's really stepping up to the plate in new ways. Now we're gonna hear from Johnny Davis, who is in Jasper County and is the head of Parks and Rec. Uh, I grew up not having anything to do with art. I have zero artistic qualities, uh, so I would probably be the last person you'd expect to, to lead this charge. I think one of the greatest thing is that I've been able to build relationships to, to new, meet, uh, meet new people along the way. I think that's been fantastic. Just having opportunities to, to see the state, to see uh, the, uh, the places that you wouldn't necessarily see, you know. When traveling through the country, we always try to get the fastest and straightest route to where we're going. And, and uh, so it's been nice to get off the beaten path, to get uh, down the back roads, to see life for what it is outside the hustle and bustle. So you've just met Johnny Davis, and he and his team have dealt with the issue of literacy in their community and looked at how arts and culture and specific programming can, um, can begin to bring more attention to that. And um, he also, through his work as the director of Parks and Rec, um, oversees six community centers in his county, which were not used um, in their entirety earlier. And now they are using these spaces in new ways um, to meet community needs, especially around arts, culture, and literacy. And so in the last year, um, from a health point of view, they've certainly been very active in advocating and promoting the vaccinations. Um, also their neighboring county, you just met Audrey in Hampton County during its disaster recovery. This, this community and this team also stepped up to the plate um, to, to work with them and to provide supplies and donations. Um, they're also engaging teaching artists as partners in their literacy efforts. Next, we're going to meet Yvette McDaniel in Bab Bamberg County. What is my community? We are uh, a rural, extremely small. It is an educated community, although people don't know that. Uh, it's diverse uh, and it has a lot of natural beauty. We are uh, a place that people pass through, however. So you've just met Dr. Yvette McDaniel, the maven in, in Bamber County, and through her work, she's engaging closely with young people in the community, getting them involved in projects like community gardening. Um, she is also engaging uh, younger folks in um, the systems and the convenings that happen in our state and um, is, is known for bringing scores of young people to Advocacy Day at the State House, for instance. Um, they also have devised a, a little people's learning page that um, the young people have created and is distributed through local grocery stores and we're in a partnership now where these um, may also be devised for seniors in our communities in South Carolina. So they have a Fifth Friday event that always includes a nutrition and active living component. They are volunteering with another um, organization that's focused on food access and sovereignty. And they've named their, um, their team the Community Rural Arts Work League, CRAWL for short. So next we're going to hear from Brooke Bauer, who is the co-maven with Lainey Buckley in, for the Catawba Indian Nation. I am Brooke Bauer. Uh, I don't represent a county, but I represent the Catawba Nation in York County, uh, right outside of Rock Hill, South Carolina. I really enjoyed hearing other mavens' stories. It kind of helped start my thought process about 
you know, how we can present it to our community and get feedback from them. But also that even though we're right here at the beginning and we don't know what we're doing yet, um, that we will, that there is light at the end of the tunnel. So as we began this process, um, and I think that's what Brooke Bauer is speaking to, is it is a process of coming together with community and deciding what the focus is going to be. And in the Catawba Indian Nation, um, she and co-maven uh, Lainey Buckley have, and their um, team have determined that the construction of an iconic um, kind of art element, cultural element for uh, the Catawba Indian Nation is a brush arbor. And so you see here a schematic of a brush arbor that is, is being conceived and the plans for its development um, are being uh, devised. And so what's significant about this is that this public art piece is going to be designed to really foster connections between elders, community members, and youth. Um, it will be at a senior living center on the reservation, and it's going to be a space where customs, traditions, and practices can be shared. And so one of the things that they've talked about is this chain of isolation that leads to higher suicide rates. And so the idea being that this, this is going to begin to combat that um, as a place is, that's like no other on the reservation. Next, we're going to hear from our co-chair, Bob Reeder. It's not the project, it's the relationships, it's the project's agenda. It's the humanization of one to the other. It's like, hey, wait a minute, you're black, I'm white. You're big, I'm small. You're short, I'm tall. But we both love our town. So uh, we, part of the framework of this initiative is that we not only have mavens, who have teams, we have creative connectors who are working with us, but we also have an advisory council. So I'd like to shout out Bob Reeder and Pam Bro, who are our co-chairs. And this advisory council, um, it represents different entities within our state and across the nation that help keep us plugged in and serve as another resource for this initiative. Next, I'd like to um, introduce you to Lydia. Lydia Cotton is the maven um, for Berkeley County. And you see there, it's down towards the coast. It's close to Charleston. And Lydia has been um, an active uh, community volunteer, passionate for many years. And she brings the Hispanic community into the fold, into the conversation in partnership with the city of Hanahan, uh, the doors of community in Hanahan was a project that happened in June this past, um, this past year. And we're excited uh, to, to help support the interconnectivity and the new engagement that happens in this community. And so in addition, um, it, through Lydia and the organization called Art Pot, um, they created a video for children and families about COVID-19, and they, they took a different um, tact with the, film, with the story of Little Red Riding Hood. And um, she and her team are key connectors in Berkeley County and also have a close relationship with local law enforcement, and they're building connectivity there as well. So we're going to hear from Lydia in just a minute. Um, but I wanted to also mention that there are resources about creative placemaking that are excellent. And the Art of Community Rural SC, as you can see here, is one of the featured case studies in this uh, resource guide. So I would point you to that as a resource. And also I'd like to say, um, as I talk about why grassroots leadership and local voice matter, um, this is what we've learned. Networks matter, relationships matter. This framework has given people a sense of hope that vision spurs new vision. Listening and learning together builds capacity and knowing you're not alone fosters hope. And then we also have had an emphasis on seeing other places and bringing those ideas home. So we wanna say that our people are our champions 
and thank the Mavens especially for the work that they do. Also, this is another um, resource that I'd point you to. This just came out last week. Um, it's from the Kresge Foundation and it's an excellent resource and has case studies in it as well. But it also breaks down in this frame here what I believe we're doing here in South Carolina and have been doing for the last five years since we created the Art of Community Role SC. So with that, I'd like to then turn it to Lydia Cotton for the last word. Mi nombre es Lydia Cotton, y soy el Maven del Condado de Berkeley, South Carolina. It's a platform, it's a platform that we all have, not only me, but in this case, I have it now, where we can really spread the word with everybody just to mention that we are Maven, that we are working close to the South Carolina Commission of the Arts. And the, and the background of those three years that is being already done is gonna help me to call the attention to people. We are serious about it. We had the opportunity and Cecil is tremendous. It's a big platform that I hope everybody realize how big it is, I do. This is a major education point for me. This is a major stepping point where I learning something that even though I've been working so many years in other areas and other counties, I feel elevated. I feel motivated. I feel that I have a platform. I feel that it gave me the tools to move on forward. So definitely it's huge. So thank you again. I've enjoyed presenting to you today about why grassroots leadership and local voices matter. We'd like to thank all of our uh, friends and sponsors and partners. And now I'd like to um, turn it over to, to Beverly Wilson. We'll share more of her story with you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Beverly Wilson and I am the executive director and co-founder for Food Share South Carolina. We received funding from the South Carolina Center for Rural and Primary Healthcare, which we're extremely grateful. Here at Food Share South Carolina, we believe that access to fresh, affordable food should not be limited by where someone works or where they live or how much money they make. And by tackling those issues of affordability and accessibility, we feel that we can really make an impact in food security. One of the ways that we impact food security is through our program offering of our fresh food box. This is an opportunity for anyone in the community to purchase a large or a small food box using cash or their EBT card. If a family uses their EBT card, for example, this large box, they pay $10 on their EBT card and then we match the other $10 using a state healthy bucks program. Some states call them double up programs or double bucks, but this is a really neat program that allows a family to stretch their food dollar. This next slide is um, an example of a number of small food boxes. This box costs $15 in cash, or if a family purchases this box using their EBT card, they only pay $5 and then we match the other 10 using that Healthy Bucks program. This is a screenshot of our calendar, uh, our packing and distribution calendar. We offer participants in the community an opportunity to purchase these boxes every other week and uh, comes out to be about 26 times per year. And it's a really great way um, to help those families receiving SNAP to stretch their food dollar. So um, for a lot of our families, they don't want to come into the hub or place their order in advance each time. So we'll find out when that card loads, um, when their EBT card loads, and we'll just go ahead and charge them for their boxes for that month as soon as the money loads. And it's a really great way to ensure the family has enough food for the entire month. In every uh, food box, we include a recipe card so that in case you're not 
um, comfortable in cooking butternut squash or spaghetti squash, you can refer to our recipe insert and get some tips. Or maybe you don't know a lot about uh, cooking with cauliflower. Uh, these, are, these are really fun um, ways to get new ideas. And these are in every box. So we're scaling this model throughout the state of South Carolina using what we're calling a hub and spoke model. So what we do is we come alongside uh, nonprofits that are um, in communities that are already doing some type of food access work or who are deeply embedded in the communities they're serving, maybe providing some type of resources. And we provide technical assistance to, for them to replicate the food share model in their community. Um, we work very hard to identify the right partner because especially in these rural communities, these families really trust the organizations that are there. So instead of us coming from the city, you know, to pop up this program, we work alongside of the nonprofits there who already have earned the trust of the community. And we provide them with what they need to replicate um, the food share model. The member hubs, they pack the boxes and distribute them. And then dental clinics, medical clinics and schools and churches, they serve as partner sites where um, community members can come say, go to their local church, place their order for a food share box. That church, someone from the church comes to the member hub, picks up that, those 10, 20, 30 boxes and takes those back, take those back to the respective communities so that the participant doesn't have to drive as far. This next slide shows the locations of our member hubs um, who have replicated the food share model so far. All of these except three are located in rural communities. Um, and we're on track to double this number in the next couple of years, which is exciting. As you can see on the left-hand side, there are a number of nonprofit organizations who um, have started the Food Share program. Um, we've had a really successful um, group out of Lee County. It's an African-American church um, who's replicated the model. Uh, they had a dry goods pantry and wanted to offer um, fresh fruits and vegetables. So they've recently launched and have been extremely successful. We have a United Way agency in Kershaw County who's replicated the model. And we even have a rural health network in um, the northern part of the state who has just recently launched. So we, we work with a variety, variety of community um, partners. This next slide is actually um, a photo of the church that I was just telling you about. This is Mount Calvary Missionary Baptist Church in Lee County. Um, again, they had that dry goods pantry and wanted to, wanted to have some high quality fresh fruits and vegetables. So they have replicated the model and done really well. They are run by, the whole church is run by um, a nonprofit, I mean, excuse me, a, um, a volunteer workforce. And they crank out about five to 600 boxes a week, which is pretty amazing. Um, they're all, I said, the whole volunteer network are over 60. And so they, they're a hardworking group of people. Um, about 65% of those boxes are purchased using SNAP. So we, we use that as a metric to um, make sure we're really serving those most in need. This next slide is, is um, what it looks like for us to, to come into a nonprofit's facility and help them get their conveyor belt set up um, and help them to understand how to stage the produce, how to organize it so that, um, you know, one item isn't crushing the other. Um, and just to help them to get the program started, it takes about 20 volunteers to pack anywhere from six to 800 boxes in about three hours. So it's a lean system. And this last thing um, I'd like to share before I conclude is our solution to um, transportation issues. A lot of our families in the rural communities 
um, live very, very far away from any retail establishment where they could access food. And so what we've done is take, um, this is our neighbor share program. And we, it's just like Meals on Wheels, except we use um, community volunteers to deliver food share boxes. It's been extremely successful for, um, for customers who don't have any transportation at all or who lack any kind of social support network that could help them get their box. Um, but it, it's been very successful. And we take, we take referrals from social workers, faith-based organizations, and even um, clients can call us themselves and self-refer. But we go through uh, their information just to make sure that um, you know, they don't have transportation and really need um, this next level of, um, of service. And that's it, we're really excited. We're hoping that in the next um, four and a half years that every county in food share will have, I mean, every county in South Carolina will have access to a food share program. Thank you. Your patients expect clear and accurate billing information with payment options that are fast and simple. It's time to exceed your patients' expectations. It's time for the TrueBridge Early Out Collection Service. Clients of our Early Out Collection Service enjoy easy to read personalized patient statements with live US-based patient support professionals available should any questions arise. Patient payment options that fit the needs of all patients Patient collection notes and activities enter directly into your patient accounting system. To learn more, visit us at truebridge.com slash earlyoutservice. VersaBadge is an automated time study technology that helps critical access hospitals to more accurately capture reimbursable time for the CMS cost report. We used to have our physicians do manual time studies and that's very time consuming and they weren't always accurate. It's the right thing to do from a compliance standpoint to enhance revenue opportunities for our critical access hospitals. I can't think of many things that we could invest our money in that would give us that quick of a return. It was a no-brainer that we wanted to try this and it's been a spectacular experience.